All right, a new type of uh, film study. We're doing a little video thing here where we're going to kind of break down the, some defensive packages so that when the Ravens start playing, you can see this in the preseason game Thursday and especially in opening week, you can start to pick out some of these packages as the Ravens are lining them up. And, of course, we've got the best teacher that we could have for all of this as Ken McCusick's going to break down this what's that defense for us. So, Ken McCusick, how are you doing? Life's good, Josh. How about you? I'm doing well. I mean, it's a, we're doing a live stream. We, it's first time we're trying video. I think this is a new, exciting, uh, new venture for film study. So I'm all good. Good. Nice and experimental. Love it. And uh, we'll go through this. Hopefully there's a, people interested in doing this sort of thing. So tonight we're just going to talk about uh, exactly what Josh said is, is what's that defense is the, is the presentation. And this is intended to allow you to identify what the Ravens are doing from your seat, whether that's at home, the stadium, wherever you might be, uh, to look at the defense, to use some of the same tricks that I use as an analyst to record the defensive players by play. Uh, I'll explain to you how I do it, and hopefully that makes it a little easier for you to pick apart quickly what the what the defense is lining up or what the defensive personnel is. And again, right here we're talking package. We're really not talking uh, zone or man defense. Or we may stray into that, but it's not the central purpose of this. We're really talking about the defensive package and how often and uh, what the Ravens do when they run each of these. So along those lines, the first thing we need to talk about is what is the base package? And, and there really isn't one is the simple answer. There are really two base packages that Ravens have. So they have a base 3-4 and they have a nickel. And which they use is really a choice of the offense in terms of the number of wide receivers they put on the field. So when the offense puts three wide receivers on the field, they're said to force the nickel defense, which forces a slot corner onto the field, makes that defense lighter. Some offensive coordinators really like to run into that nickel more than they like to run into a standard package or use a fullback, have an extra blocker of themselves. They really would rather deny the defense an additional heavy on the field. So uh, it's become very popular to run uh, at most running plays and, in fact, most formations out of 11 personnel today, one tight end, one running back, instead of uh, 12 or 21 personnel like the Ravens do a lot, where they either have a fullback in the game as one of two running backs or they have two tight ends in the game um, and, and they run it that way. So those are the heavier ways to run that might draw a, a standard base 3-4 package as opposed to the nickel. So we'll start getting into the base package itself here. And this is the 3-4. And I'm going to explain everything with still photos because I think it's easier for me to make the points I want to make about, about the players that are on the field here. So I like to separate the defense into two groups here. This is from that week two game on a Thursday night at Cincinnati. And I look at the two groups are these core box of players that I'm circling with a laser pointer right now that are uh, the linemen and linebackers. So you got three down linemen. You have two outside linebackers with Suggs and Judon. You have two inside linebackers. This is Tony Jefferson, who's a safety. He was playing over the slot receiver Boyd on that side, but Boyd just goes into motion when this picture was taken, basically, moving to the other side of the field, and then he'll become Humphrey's responsibility at some point. I like to look at the umbrella over the defense being these defensive backs. So I kind of run my eye over that of the core players. And you should have, when you have seven here, you certainly should have four in the umbrella. When you have six, you should have five, et cetera. So um, it, it uh, is something you can you pick out pretty quickly once you get used to what you're looking for uh, in this case. This is anyway the base 34 defense. One of the questions that comes up a lot about this is how often they play the base 3-4. And it's actually not as often as you might think. Only 15.8% of snaps have four defensive backs on the field. Um, I know the other night they mentioned on the uh, regular season, uh, sorry, the preseason game, that they used 17%, I think, uh, which uh, in 2018, which is actually looks like the combination of three and four defensive backs uh, was 17%. So anyway, about 15.8% with, um, with three defensive, uh, sorry, with four defensive backs. Now, I've got two pictures of a lot of these defenses that I'll be showing you as we go through. So this is known as the All-22 
because it's an end zone view that gives you, in theory, view of all 22 numbers or the best view of all 22 numbers. Now, in point of fact, we can't see the uh, uh, Tony Jefferson or the left cornerback Humphrey on this play. Sorry, the left quarterback is Carr on this play. Uh, but we can see the other numbers and we can see them well. So this is supposed to be the best angle. Depending on where the teams are on the field, it gives you more or less numbers in total to look at. So again, it's the uh, uh, this is the all 22. And the previous slide, I'll go page up one here, is the top view this is called. Even though a lot of people call it all 22, it's of the coaches' view angles. This is a top view. And this is the one that allows you to judge route depth best and uh, where those routes are being cut off, the route tree, and how that, that works, how the defenders in the secondary are, are going. Very hard to do any meaningful analysis of what the secondary does other than plays on which they're targeted without seeing this, this nice top view uh, angle. So anyway, that's the, that's the base 3-4 defense. And now we'll move on to the standard nickel. And this is their base nickel defense. So in this case, we'll do the same thing. We've got a core of six defenders here, which include two down linemen, two outside linebackers, and two inside linebackers here. But there's also the umbrella, which now consists of five defenders, including this slot corner. Now, uh, one of the things that you'll notice from this is uh, the slot corner is the addition, and there's a, there's a defensive tackle or a nose tackle that'll come off the field. One way to look at the defense clearly is to look at it for substitutions, and you'll frequently see that there is one, a one-for-one one substitution going from, say, a first and 10 to a second and nine play where a slot corner comes on the field and a defensive tackle goes off. So anyway, that's, uh, that's the one change uh, necessary for that. I'm going to check on some technical difficulties, make sure, Josh, are we still here? Are we still live? Yeah, you're all good. We had a little issue early in the show. It's been straightened out, so you're all good. Okay, wonderful. I don't, I don't see you on the Twitter uh, box. So should I take take that off the screen? Oh, uh, I'm sorry, not the Twitter box, the Skype box. No, I just turned myself off so I wouldn't be distracting okay. as I was facing the issue. Um, all right. Anyway, so we're still good. We, we may have some technical questions. We go through this. We said this is very experimental for us. Anyway, going through this. Hope you'll get your questions in. We'll stop as necessary. Josh will uh, uh, cut me out here at some point and and, uh, and ask questions as needed. Anyway, nickel defense. 53.7% of all snaps. So it is the prevalent package for the Ravens defense. And I think for all defenses, there may be some that use the dime a little bit more, but the Ravens at 53.7% certainly are a, are a nickel team uh, primarily. So this is one view of it. I think I've got one more view of it here from the same nickel. So you notice the, um, uh, the sets on the defensive line there, how the defensive, uh, uh, the uh, outside linebackers are, and then we still got two inside linebackers on the play. All right, now let's talk about a fairly oddly used variation of this, which is known as Big Nickel. And you'll hear me refer to it or sometimes put it in on the uh, uh, articles that I write in the, in the last preseason game against the Eagles. They, they played this two snaps. And this is called Big Nickel because you replace the slot corner with a safety instead. So it's kind of like having a, a heavier version of the nickel, that's a Big Nickel, and Clark is a better run support player than Tavon Young, who would have been the other choice last year um, at this spot. So that's the reason why they play big nickel. Now, the Ravens obviously coming up this season will have they have to go without Tavon. And so because they don't really have a high end slot corner now, we, we, we assume Brandon Carr will get a chance there uh, as the primary they may decide that they want to run a fair amount of this big nickel uh, to kind of get two and a half cornerbacks on the field, if you want to think of it that way, but still have five defensive backs uh, in total. So just another way to approach this. And that Buffalo game, it was rainy, if you recall, in that first game of the season. And you know, Buffalo is certainly much more of a running team with their couple of backup quarterbacks they, they used in that game and uh, was really uh, – more susceptible to big nickel. They didn't run that all much, all that much for the whole season, and I don't have an exact count. I didn't separate that from other nickels. I'm, I would estimate they probably ran it 15 to 20 times the entire season. Uh, so it's not it's not that common a package. Just have one one uh, slide on that. We'll move on now, and we'll talk about something else. And this is an odd one that they just introduced last year. They didn't play this before Martindale. This is called the jumbo nickel. That's what I call it anyway. 
in Madden, if you play that, they call this the 335 nickel. There is actually no common terminology that I've available. I talked to a Bears intern. Uh, they call it Penny there as they chart their plays. But here's the, the main characteristic is this. You still get the nickel defense. So run your eyes along the outside of the umbrella again. You see these five defensive backs are on the field, including Tavon. And they still also have three down linemen. So Ricard, Pierce, and I'm not sure if that's Wormley or who it is exactly, probably Wormley, uh, are there. But then they also have two outside linebackers. So there's only one inside linebacker, which is where they make the sacrifice. Now, I thought this was interesting here because the, uh, the jumbo nickel is intended to help you put out a better run defense with still using the nickel. because it gives you that extra down lineman, very hard to run on that, of course. But if they break through, then you've only got one inside linebacker to fill gaps. So there is some risk there. And what you need is you need safeties who really know what you're doing. So in this case, I think it's particularly appropriate that you see Mosley here pointing back at Tony Jefferson and saying, basically, you know your assignment here. I'm not, I'm not, uh, I can guess. <laughs> we don't have a second inside linebacker here, so you need to fill quickly. And, uh, and I thought that was just an interesting shot that, uh, that it came up that way. Good key reading by that strong safety in particular, absolutely essential to make this defense work. So uh, that's one you'll occasionally see. And uh, if you're looking for it on the field, uh, probably the better angle to see it from is this, where it really looks odd that there is only one inside linebacker behind the three defensive linemen and two, and two outside linebackers here. So, uh, uh, you know, two ways to look at the same thing. It's probably more evident from this uh, second of the two. All right, let's move on here. Now, this is one of my favorites, of course. You hear me talk about the dime defense all the time, and this is the Ravens in the dime. And uh, a number of things come up. First of all, dime package is a pass defense package, so it's used primarily in, in obvious passing situations. You might also use it at the end of the half when the other team has to move a long way in, say, a minute or a minute and a half, and you, you really need to defend against the pass. Certainly in the fourth quarter, you can move to an all-dime situation uh, when the other team is a, a touchdown or two down in the final minutes and, and you know they have to pass. It's a, uh, uh, you know, a defense that, that has more flexibility, certainly in terms of coverages, with the addition of one particular player. I'll go to the next slide to show this. Anthony Levine, who lines up in the middle of the field, effectively as a second inside linebacker. So Levine comes in on this play, or, or the dime back does, and replaces your weak side linebacker while your Mike linebacker still stays in the game. In this case, obviously, C.J. Mosley. So uh, the flexibility this offers is fairly significant because you can you, Levine obviously brings all sorts of coverage flexibility because he's perfectly capable of covering a running back, a tight end, man-to-man, -man, dropping into a short zone, but he can also rush, rush the passer. Now, why is that important? Well, on third and medium, or in particular, it's more important to get a quick pressure than just about anything else because you have third and four, third and five, third and seven. In the NFL, quick release times and, and quick passes to get that first down are king. Quarterbacks have much higher accuracy than they used to in throwing those passes and completing them. So the key is really, and the onus is on the defense, to generate that quick pressure. Now, a linebacker has a better chance to beat a running back for pressure, but the best way to get a quick pressure is to get an unblocked free runner. And by having Levine on the field, not only can he rush the passer, to create that free runner, but you also have more options in terms of guys you would bring from the edge or overloading perhaps to get that quick pressure on, on third and short. So a lot of things you could do. Anthony Levine, obviously the key to this defense, had a huge year last year. It was the best year of any dime defender in Ravens history. And going back to the beginning, um, you know, Corey Harris and Chad Williams had some great years, but uh, Levine in 2018 was the best there, there ever was as a, as a dime for the Ravens. You see anything else I need to cover on this here? 28.5% of the snaps in 2018 were of this dime variety. So it's 293. They played the dime defense almost twice as often as they play that base 3-4. So that gives you an idea of, of just how important this is. Dean Pease early years, he, he was with the Ravens as defensive coordinator six years. They played the dime defense only 3% of the time, dime or quarter, only 3% of the time from 2012 through 2017. In 2018, 
Um, Levine's value was finally realized, and they went back to playing uh, a fair amount of dime. There are a lot of reasons why I like it more than, than playing the nickel on passing situations. Uh, one of the big reasons is it's a much more economical defense from ca- a cap perspective. So as a GM, putting my GM hat, I really like that. Um, you, you have Levine and Owasso and Kenny Young shared that position last year. And those three players this year will only make about $6 million. They made less last year. If you had to get find the three-down unicorn who could cover that for you, not only do you have to have Mosley as a unicorn who can do all those things, you have to have a second guy, a Bart Scott or someone like that, and you're going to end up spending $25, $30 million on your inside linebackers to keep those guys down the road. So from a GM perspective, it makes a lot more sense to, to have a weak side linebacker platoon and if you look at the combined stats of that position last year, I've, I've talked about it many times, so I won't bore you with it again. But uh, among other things, they had nine snaps and a bunch of passes defense. Uh, you got tremendous value out of out of platooning. If you're an Oriole baseball fan, you remember Lowenstein and Renicky as a as a great platoon, and uh, the weak side linebacker backup platoon for the 2018 Ravens was was every bit as good. All right, move on to the next one here, and. We are now in a fairly esoterically used package, the quarter. Now, the Ravens in the past have used more quarter. That's seven defensive backs on the field. But in 2018, they used it just eight times. And you can't quite see it here, but on the quarter defense, we have Clark and Levine in replacing both inside linebackers. So this is against against Denver. I believe this is a game Mosley was out in any case. He missed it, and um, so it was easier to make that choice and get get Clark and Levine on the field here both. Uh, but anyway, this is a this is a quarter package that we have on the field right now with those guys replaced, and they were both the quarter, the dime back, and the quarter back would both be in the middle of field, short middle. They give you that extra coverage flexibility. Either one of them can cover. Either one of them can rush the passer. And, uh, and you have that, uh, that advantage there. Now, this also happens to be a race car package up here. Now, we're going to talk about this a little bit later as well, but you'll notice that there are four uh, outside linebackers in on this package to rush the quarterback. So you have Bowser, Zadaria Smith, Matt Judon, and Terrell Suggs over here. There's no defensive lineman on the field. The Ravens ran this a few times uh, in 2018 and very, very successfully when they did. Uh, let's see, I have the numbers here for the race car. They used it six snaps for minus seven yards in 2018 with four or five outside linebackers on the field. And there were no positive plays, one interception and two sacks. So, uh, very impressively used, uh, defense there that, uh, last year. All right. I want to talk about this one here. This is a heavy set that the Ravens use. Now, normally you'd want at least four defensive backs on the field, particularly in today's NFL. But in this play, on a first down play, Cleveland uh, started with an extra offensive lineman on the field here. You see this this guy over here is not a tight end. He's actually an offensive lineman uh, that's on the field. And the Ravens felt like they, under these circumstances, with only one wide receiver in the game, were better served to only have a single uh, cornerback and two safeties, as you would normally have, including... Jefferson, who has to cover both tight ends on this side or, or be, be available to cover the deeper of the two tight ends on this side. And it gives the Ravens a better chance, obviously, with four down linemen in a 4-4-3 alignment to stop the run. So that's what they, uh, they did in this particular case. Now, in terms of prevalence, they only ran versions of this 4-4-3 heavy on thir- for 13 snaps last year, approximately 1.3% of plays. So it's not common. Uh, They ran it, Cleveland ran three times for 10, minus one, and minus four against this defense. So the Ravens did uh, fairly well in terms of that. The second form of the heavy we'll often see is is the goal line formation. That's the more common place that we see it. And let's see if I have have another angle on this so I don't have the goal line. But it's more common with the Ravens than goal line to have this four down lineman uh, alignment have two outside linebackers to the edge of that, and then often two safeties on the edge of that so that they're playing eight along the line of scrimmage and only have three guys in the end zone uh, to cover. And in fact, two of those are inside linebackers who are looking to shoot gaps 
and uh, stop a short running play. So those goal line formations are often uh, set up, these goal line heavy formations in particular, against 0-32, I, as I noted on my, on my formation sheet, which is three tight ends and two running backs um, in the game uh, on goal line sets. That's a very prevalent set for the Ravens to run on offense for themselves. One of the interesting things about goal lines formations, and I, I don't know if I have a version of this or not. Yeah, I do have one. Okay, is once you get down here in the goal line, this is the this is kind of a standard goal line thing. I the formation that I look up because you got a safety on each edge. You have uh, actually five down, including Zedaria Smith, who's an outside linebacker. You have Suggs uh, standing, but you have eight guys at the line of scrimmage, and you have only three guys behind them with Board and Mosley really looking to aggressively shoot a gap once they uh, see where the run is headed. Uh, but it's very difficult uh, when you get down by the goal line to change offensive personnel. So oftentimes you'll see teams try and run a, a quick no huddle play if they uh, uh, gain five or six yards to get down to the one yard line. It's often a, a chance to catch the defense before they're able to make a switch uh, to get their heaviest possible personnel in. And you notice in this case that the Bengals have actually got number 94, Sam Hubbard, a defensive end in at the um, at uh, fullback, so they're really trying to lead this with heavy in addition to the to the six offensive linemen and two tight ends they have. So a very heavy formation by the Bengals and a good counter here by the Ravens. Now we saw a version of this earlier, but this is the race car again. And this one has not just four, but five outside linebackers on the field at one time. Uh, we have Bowser. This is Darius Smith, even though you can't see his, uh, his number exactly. We have Mosley, uh, Judon, and Terrell Suggs. And they're running that in a, in a play. Uh, they ran three times here against Buffalo. And uh, they got sack, interception sack on the three times they tried it against Buffalo in this game. So fantastic results. Uh, not sure that it would work under all circumstances against all teams, but Martindale had something. Just was great to see him in his first game as the Ravens defensive coordinator pick out something this special get every single one on the on the field all their outside linebackers when you really question how are they going to make use of five outside linebackers we saw lots of times where they in the dime they bump an outside linebacker to the inside and you'll see Zedaria Smith often lined up for a three-point stance on the inside but to get all five of them on the field is really something special. And, you know, I think we'll see some creativity of various sorts from Martindale this year. It wouldn't surprise me, given the success of these various race car packages they had last year, um, if w that we'll see those a little more often this year. So definitely something uh, we can look forward to. Oh, uh, now let's see. Yep, we got one more to show you here. And this defense is not exactly the one the Ravens want to line up on often. Uh, they're down by the goal line here in this game, a game against Buffalo. And unfortunately, they're lined up with just 10 men on the field. And you can, you can kind of see they've got, uh, you know, five worth the line of scrimmage here and then another five umbrellaing over those guys. And they don't have the proper number on the field. Now, the great thing was Zedaria still, Smith still stopped this play for a loss of two. It really should have been a sack. But uh, it really should have been called a sack, but uh, but was not. Uh, and uh, interestingly enough, the Ravens had pretty good success stopping plays when they had 10 men on the field. They lined up four times that way in, 20, in 2018, four times they played short. PFF did a study a couple of years ago and, and published the results saying that they had had 32 times, there were 32 occurrences in the league where uh, a defense had lined up with just 10 men on the field. 16 of them were the Arizona Cardinals, who play a lot of dime. Uh, the Ravens, unfortunately, lined up four times short last year, which is, you know, obviously about four times the share they should have had. So not, not a good look for the Ravens, not what they want to do, but it does happen occasionally. And if you're, particularly if you're charting players, you want to make sure you capture this when you can and, and uh, get it done. Now, one of the reasons I want to just talk about this, and then we'll, we'll, we'll jump to some questions here. The person I cannot do this without is, without is Maureen, my wife, and she does a wonderful job with all sorts of note-taking at home, but also uh, when we're at the games, even a rainy game, she'll find a way to record the secondary for me. So this is Maureen, and uh, for that Buffalo game, she's scoring inside a plastic bag uh, to try and write down the members of the secondary. So I just want to make sure she gets the due credit here for all the effort she puts in on this with, uh, with me. Thanks, Maureen. Anyway, guys, I think we'll go and, and we'll have questions now if there's anything, Josh, to go through. 
Uh, there are not any questions right now. I believe you've been doing a great job explaining it, so people have been uh, just following along. Okay, well, that's great. If you are, we're going to have this out on the website. The recording will be there so people can look at it. So if you watch it again, you have questions, stick them out there. I'll try and answer them directly, and uh, and we'll uh, we'll look at it then. Yeah, this video is going to be posted. It'll stay on Twitter and Facebook, and we'll end up putting it up on filmstudyravens.com as well. So it'll be out there. And a pretty good uh, first exper- experiment to uh, see how this whole live streaming thing works. So. If you like this, if you want more of this for our regular shows, you just just let us know. Yes, please do. Uh, and uh, you know, Josh mentioned filmstudyravens.com. Uh, we, you know, the articles are out there. The podcasts are out there. We're going to have some additional charts that are put out there. I, well, I did get the question about adding a chart for uh, Pass Rush. And we're going to do a little bit about this this year. We do have a presentation if people would like to see it on Pass Rush comparisons between uh, P's, Martindale, and also Rex Ryan involved. So if you want to have, okay. go through a little bit of Ravens uh, history, we'll have a chance to do that uh, hopefully in the coming weeks. All right. And, of course, we'll have brand new episodes of the podcast out this weekend, Friday and Saturday. Ken, do you know who's joining us this weekend? Yes. Actually, it's just Friday. We're doing a show, and this is All roster right, cut down week. Because of cut downs, of course. Exactly. So it's, it's, it's one article, and it'll cover fewer players than it normally does because a lot of the people who've made the team won't be playing, of course, and a lot of the people even who are on the, on the fringe of the roster won't, won't get too much playing time. But, uh, but there will be some players who are still playing for roster spots. We'll talk about that. And then on Friday, uh, around 4 p.m., we're taping a show with Vaz Laricos of Baltimore B-Town, and that'll be an opportunity to put our roster prediction in place. You can still use it for your Ravens uh, uh, roster guests on their uh, on their contest. I hope they're still having that this year. That's a, That's been a great thing in the past. But anyway. But you haven't won it yet. I have not won it, no. And and uh, I did meet a guy on Twitter who had run it and had pictures of himself, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm happy for him. You, you win a free jersey, I think it might be autographed, so it's okay. a good, uh, good item. All right, that's exciting. And, of course, we'll figure out something to do the following week as we wait for the first game. Yeah, we're gonna, we'll have the first of our Know Your Foe episodes coming up before the Dolphins game and have a really good guest. Travis Wingfield is a terrific analyst who covers the Miami Dolphins on Lockdown Dolphins, and uh, we really look forward to having him for that. We're going to talk a lot of very deep, nerdy football strategy during that. It's mostly, well, he'll be doing most of the talking to talk about how the Dolphins normally line up against various opponents and it's really to learn the Dolphins personnel and that's what the Know Your Foe series is about. Gotcha. All right, Ken, before we get out of here, how about one quick question that came in a little late from Nick Blevins over on Facebook who's wondering, Ken, how would you want to see the Ravens defend the Cardinals with their four wide package? Oh, it's a, that's a great question. Um, you know, what we saw in the game, uh, let's go back to one of the obvious ones. We saw a lot of quarter defense here from the L.A. Chargers in the playoff game. And with the spread looks that the Cardinals are likely to show, I think more defensive backs and fewer linebackers is probably going to be the the ideal situation. In fact, for that game, and I know the the Ravens have said they'll do it on a game-by-game basis, but they also said that Peanut is getting the green dot, and and it's been an inside linebacker all of preseason. But for that game in particular, there's probably never been a better opportunity to have Tony Jefferson call the signals and allow for some of this quarter package transitions and, and get uh, a di- the quarter package on the field in, and replace both of the inside linebackers in so doing. So give you a lot more pass rush flexibility, some spy flexibility uh, to deal with Kyler Murray. But Kyler Murray had a pretty bad game, and his first outing was, was a lot better. Uh, in the last game, so uh, it'll be interesting to see what he brings in game two, but we're certainly expecting a, a very fun, fast-paced game. All right. All right. Thank you, Ken. You know what's exciting about doing something live is as we close out the show, I can make a comment and tell people to go check out Masson because the Orioles are playing really well tonight against the Nats, and you get to see Hunter Harvey pitch right now, which has been always fun. Very good. So he's, he's hit 100 miles an hour Most, so far since he came up? Multiple times, yes. Wonderful. Yeah. Uh, now, he just gave up a triple to Trey Turner, but who doesn't give up a triple to Trey Turner? <laughs> so, all righty. All right, Ken. Well, we will speak soon. Enjoy your evening. Mm-hmm.